Election College, Episode 23, The Election of 1852. In this episode, Democrats, Whigs, wait, what's the difference? Oh, and the Whig Party dies. Let's throw a political party. Face it, the political scene sucks, but did it always? It's time for election college, and class is in session. Now, your hosts, Jason Goff and Ben Smith. Hey everyone, I'm Jason Goff. And I'm Ben Smith. And thanks for joining us for another episode of Election College. Let's get into it. So it's 1852 and our friend, everybody's friend, Millie Millard Fillmore is president. In the last episode, we talked about how President Zachary Taylor won the 1848 election. Zachary Taylor makes me think of Zachary Taylor Thomas from Home Improvement. Yeah. 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 Me too. Yeah. He's probably um, washed up, but if he's listening, hey, buddy. How you doing? Yeah. Uh, hey, and and Zach, if you're watching, um, I see your picture at the bottom of some of the blogs I read, like 18 celebrities that you would never recognize today. But I don't click on those links because that's bad stuff. Now I really want to know what he looks like now. Bad stuff when you click those links. I didn't want to know until you said that. Now I'm curious. I think that's how those articles work. No. <laughs> <laughs> so Taylor, um, that's President Zachary Taylor. Right. He dies in 1850 after eating cherries and ice milk in filthy, wretched Washington, D.C. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, the Compromise of 1850 happens and everyone loves Millie, right? Well, kind of. The Compromise of 1850 was this battle between slavery and pro-slavery, uh, between anti-slavery and pro-slavery factions. And quite frankly, the, the Compromise wouldn't have happened if Taylor hadn't died. And, well, when Taylor does die and Fillmore becomes president, pretty much every member of Taylor's cabinet resigns. Ouch. Yeah. That's like, you know, I hear this a lot. But it's kind of like, you know, the, the person who's on stage and they drop the mic and they exit. <laughs> I feel like yeah. that's what happened. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> so, oh, I just see, I just see Millard. He's in the, in the West Wing or whatever it was at that time. And everybody just goes, okay, see ya. Good luck. Yeah. Sorry. We, uh, we didn't sign up to work under you. Oh. So the Compromise of 1850, that that's really a, big on his legacy. But um, there were a lot of good things, you know. It, it averted war, and um, yeah, the country was kind of at peace at this point because of the compromise. But there was this aspect of this compromise that was just totally going to do Fillmore's reputation in, and that was the Fugitive Slave Law. Yeah, if you don't recall from the last episode or you haven't listened to it, uh, you should. But the uh, the Fugitive Slave Law required that all escaped slaves were required to be returned to their masters by any officials or citizens or pets or whatever of any free states. Mm. They had to cooperate with the law and... It went. It was such a bad law that abolitionists, the people who were against slavery, actually nicknamed it the Bloodhound Law because of the dogs that were used to track down runaway slaves. Can you imagine? No. First, I can't imagine. Like, I don't like the idea of being chased by a dog because the dog is mad at me f because I walked on its property or on the sidewalk. I can't imagine its owner sicking the dog on me because of my status in society. Yeah. And think about it. You couldn't fight back or it's just a, ah, uh, yeah. 
So as the election of 1852 approaches, Milley had been long undecided whether he was going to run um, to serve as a full term uh, president or not. But in early 1852, he decided that he would. The Whigs held their national convention in June of 1852, and Fillmore was pretty much unpopular with the Northern Whigs for signing uh, the Fugitive Slave Act, Act, but not only signing it, but also for enforcing it. Yeah, he led narrowly on the early ballots, but he ended up short of a majority and really couldn't gain any votes. So on the, get this, the 52nd ballot. Wow. Daniel Webster. Yeah. Uh, his delegates switched to General Winfield Scott and that won Scott's nomination. Um, for the Whig Party. So, uh, anything else about Millie? Well, not right now, but maybe we'll talk about him again in a future episode. And just to, as a, as a side note to, um, that national convention, um, Fillmore actually was supportive. So unlike Marty, who <laughs> wanted just to blow <laughs> up the Democratic Party and destroy them. How cranky um, can I be? Yeah. <laughs> Fillmore, Fillmore just goes away for a while. Yeah. So, so have you ever heard the claim then that the two major political parties are really not that different? I have. I, I it really, it really did come to that point in 1852 between the Whigs and the Democrats. Yeah, and it's kind of crazy. I, let's back up just a little bit because 1852. For those of you who have not begun to notice this yet and you have listened to the 1844 episode of our podcast it's starting to look a lot like 1844 around here for sure we've got this incumbent president who happens to be a Whig, and he becomes president upon the death of a war hero predecessor yeah and the Whigs decide "Mm, we're not going to nominate the incumbent which is almost unheard of the Whigs decide to nominate General Winfield Scott over Millard Fillmore. And then the Democrats nominate a dark horse candidate. Uh, but this time it's Franklin Pierce. Yeah. So will history repeat itself? Hmm. So, Ben, how do you elect a president when the platforms of the major parties are almost indistinguishable? Well, if it were me, I would, well, I would, I'm not going to say what I would do. I would vote for third party probably. But (laughs) if it were the majority of people, they would vote for their favorite personality. Yeah. That seems like that's going to get a lot of people out to the polls, doesn't it? Uh, yeah, that should definitely, you know, there's nothing to, nothing to get people out to the polls like lack of issues. Yeah. Voter turnout is the lowest it had been since 1836. Ugh. Scott has an anti-slavery reputation, and Southerners are pretty put off by this. And the Whigs are divided north and south, which, you know, pro and anti-slavery for the most part. And the Whigs are just kind of a mess at this point. Yeah, and on the Democrat side, Pierce himself was a military guy. He was a brigadier general during the Mexican-American War, and he's got all of that, you know, war hero qualifier thing going on i always thought that if i was in the military i my favorite name would be brigadier general i know you don't just get to pick what rank you are but brigadier general just sounds like such a cool rank to me i don't know why you know what hey i'm a kentucky colonel Uh uh-huh i don't know if we've talked about this but i think yeah you won't you won't stop talking about it actually yeah i mean please do call me colonel (laughs) I'm, i'm gonna call you the Brigadier General. All right. Sounds good. It's an honorary Jason Goff School of Military Arts degree that I'm bestowing <laughs> here forth and henceforth <laughs> forward uh, upon you, Ben. I appreciate it greatly. Uh, by the way, you can call me Brigadier General, Ben. That's fine. Yes. Yeah. Hey, there are several other parties that put forward candidates, but... <laughs> None of them really gained any traction at all. Yeah, um, you can look it up. But for instance, Daniel Webster, (laughs) 
Get this. Okay. I'm not laughing, but I am. He dies shortly before the election, and he still got a substantial portion of the vote in Massachusetts and Georgia. Wasn't there somebody recently? I, don't, I know it wasn't for president, or maybe it was, uh, but I think it was for uh, a, a state seat or you know a Congress seat or something. Somebody died, and they had won the election just recently. Yeah. Well, there was that situation. Um, yeah, there have been a couple of situations like that, and I think once they have the ballots printed, and one of the candidates passes away that candidate's party still will run that candidate um because they could win the election still crazy and then and they get to determine who who takes the spot it i'm sure it depends on the office and in which state it right and so on but right. yeah i've i have heard of that huh crazy and i said that confidently didn't i you did, and that makes it true. Exactly. Pierce wins in a landslide. Scott only wins Kentucky, Tennessee, Massachusetts, and Vermont, which a few years back that would have been like half the states, but now it's not nearly half the states. Yeah, so we can really call it a landslide. And for a dark horse candidate, think about that. A dark horse candidate wins in a landslide. That's... I mean, that's pretty much a disaster for the Whigs. For sure. Um, talking about disasters, Ben, you know, I just think about this, about um, Franklin Pierce and his wife. They had a couple of, I believe they were sons who passed away um, early in life, just, you know, days into life. And their only surviving son, he's 11 years old, and president-elect Pierce and his wife and their son, are on this um, train and the train wrecks and his son is killed and they actually see this happen. And I mean, I I just can't imagine the the pain of that, but uh, just a few months later is his inauguration day. And of course, Mrs. Pierce doesn't, um, she doesn't make any public appearances for a while, but uh, this quote was just very moving to me as I read it. It was, um, during the address, he said, you have summoned me in my weakness. You must, you must sustain me by your strength. And I just can't imagine becoming the leader of a country after experiencing that huge tragedy. Right. Yeah. And of course, the, the president is supposed to care about all of the citizens, but come on, it's your, you can't, you can't expect them to cope very well after he just lost his only son who made it out of infancy. So tough, tough things, but even worse, or at least not, not, not worse, but not contributing to his mental health. I'm sure his incoming vice president, William King was in Cuba at the time of the inauguration. And, you know, I'm sure Pierce is thinking, well, uh, I've got somebody else to help me run the country, but King is severely ill, and he dies the following month. Uh, he had been attempting to to get better in a warmer client, climate, and he doesn't. He dies. And so Pierce is left all alone for a while. Yeah. It's just a a very interesting time in our our country's history that, Ben, I never had heard of, of just all that tragedy that happened one right after the other. And keeping right. in mind that the you know two presidents ago which was only 2 years ago the president dies in office so uh, this is just an entirely different time uh that we we really do take our good health and the good care that we have access to for granted yeah well not to make a joke of it but you know what's not in good health the wig party yeah those guys yeah yeah, so Pierce wins the election overwhelmingly. And there is a representative from Ohio named Lewis D. Campbell. He was really distraught by the defeat of the Whigs. And he said, quote, we are slain. The party is dead, dead, dead. And that, in fact, was the truth. The Whig party was dead. 
Well, I mean, not dead. We still have Henry Clay. He's always been a Whig. He's always been a champion of the Whig party. He'll he'll keep it going. Ben. Uh Uh-huh. He died in June. Oh, but he's Henry Clay. Yeah. Um... Yeah, and I well, let's talk about him a little bit. But We've talked about him in like every episode since number three or something crazy. Well, let's talk about Henry Clay for a minute. Uh, he, he was an American lawyer, a politician. Uh, he was an, uh, a pretty skilled orator who represented Kentucky in both the Senate and the House of Representatives. He actually served three terms. They weren't consecutive, but three terms as the Speaker of the House of Representatives. And then he was Secretary of State from 1825 to 1829. He ran for president three different times uh, in 1824, 32, and 44. And as we know, he did not win. Yeah, and all the way back um, from the War of 1812, he really did favor war with Great Britain. Um, and he played a significant role in leading the nation to the into that war. So you can imagine at that time, um, we were still breaking free from some of those old ties that we had with Great Britain. Um, so all the way back to 1812, uh, Henry Clay was there. Yeah, he uh, ran for president in 24, like I mentioned. He lost, but he did maneuver House voting uh, in favor of John Quincy Adams. Uh, the and then, Q. Uh, yeah, the Q. And then, of course, he was the Secretary of State as the uh, Jacksonians denounced what they considered a corrupt bargain. If you've listened to our previous episodes, you remember uh, all those facts there. And then he ran and lost again in 32 and 44. The Whig Party just wasn't the same without him after that, obviously. Yeah, and he was uh, he held a pretty strong position about about increasing tariffs to foster industry. Uh, which was very contrary to the popular Andrew Jackson in his views. He wanted to use federal funding to build and maintain infrastructure and have a strong national bank, which was, again, very much against those Jacksonian ideas. He was kind of a prophet in some senses. He opposed the annexation of Texas. He said he thought it would inject the slavery issue into politics, and of course it did, although it was already there kind of, but it became more prominent. He opposed the Mexican-American War and the idea of Manifest Destiny, uh, which probably lost him the the election of 1844. Um, Everybody called him the Great Pacificator, and... I mean, he really helped with a lot of good compromises that happened, and um, he was, you know, an opponent of slavery, which was uh, very important as well. Yeah, and at, you know, out of that, he was very instrumental in formulating the Missouri Compromise back in 1820, and then um, that Compromise of 1850 that we spoke about earlier. He really was viewed as the primary representative of Western interests. In that group that was, that consisted of Daniel Webster, who was from the North and John C. Calhoun, um, from South Carolina, um, being from Kentucky, that was considered the West. So they, um, nicknamed him Henry of the West and the Western Star, but he was a plantation owner and he held slaves during his lifetime, but, uh, he did free them in his wheel, in his will. It, it's <laughs> yeah, in his wheel. It's such a strange thing to me. I mean, I assume maybe in 150 years, people look back at our lives and say, "Why did they do the one thing and say the other?" But it's so strange to me. All these men who claim to be against slavery and want to see slavery defeated had slaves, and maybe, yeah, maybe they were great to their slaves, and maybe they treated them like workers and not slaves. But when it comes down to it. They had they held slaves, and that promoted the idea of slavery, when, even if only in, in an intrinsic kind of way. But it's just weird. It's so weird that they would be so opposed verbally and so for it in action. Right. Yeah. Listen to what I say, not what I do. Right. Very much so. Right. Abraham Lincoln, who was the Whig leader in Illinois, um, in eighteen in that early eighteen fifties was a great admirer of Clay, saying that he was, quote, my ideal 
of a great man. And Lincoln wholeheartedly supported Clay's economic programs. So, yeah, this episode obviously was not about Henry Clay entirely, but because he's been such a big part of every episode, it seems like yeah. since number four or five or something, uh, we just wanted to take a minute to talk about, wrap everything up with Henry Clay. Yeah. And also in 1852, uh, we had the death of Clay's northern counterpart, um, Daniel Webster. And, you know, during all of this time when Jackson was so popular and, um, you know, the common man, all of those um, ideals of the Jacksonian democracy, Daniel Webster and Henry Clay really stood with each other. And here you have these two guys who die in the same year. It really was significant. And and it really did symbolize the death of the Whig Party. For sure. Yeah, so two men, neither of them ever became president, though at least Clay aspired to on numerous occasions. They didn't, they, they weren't elected, but they're part of election history, and uh, we thought it'd be cool to talk about them. Yeah, it does make me wonder, Ben, who are the people who are playing a role in our government today? who will never be president, but who are those leaders that 150 years from now they'll be talking about. Yeah, that's really interesting to, to, to think about. 1852. There it is, folks. 1852. Franklin Pierce. If you want to find out more about 1852, <laughs> you can go search for 1852 on Amazon. Uh, if you go to electioncollege.com slash Amazon, anything you click on after that will really help us out. It won't cost you a dime extra. It'll help us out. We'll appreciate it. And just go search for like paraphernalia, like keychains that say 1852 on them or something. It, yeah, you you know you want one. Yeah, I'm sure there's a brand out there selling on Amazon called 1852, the Franklin Pierce collection. <laughs> but seriously, anytime you do use that link, electioncollege.com slash Amazon, uh, and you buy anything, it helps us out. It doesn't cost you a dime extra. Um, it makes us a couple pennies here and there, and uh, it helps us pay for the show. Yeah, we really appreciate it. And while you're surfing, make sure you keep that Amazon tab open. But hey, open up another tab. Type twitter.com slash election college. We'd love to interact with you there. We're also on Instagram at election college. And hey, like everyone else, we're on Facebook too at election college. Uh, one of my friends posted on Facebook recently that their 15 year old son won't have a Facebook account because Facebook's for old people. <laughs> oh my goodness. And, and I just uh, thought that was pretty humorous considering. Facebook, you could only be between the ages of like 18 and 22 when it first came out. <laughs> <laughs> but now it's for old people, which maybe that's true. I don't know. I'm old. Yeah, I guess so. All right. Well, uh, don't forget to leave us a review on iTunes at electioncollege.com slash review. We appreciate it. It helps the show out and helps other people find us and tune in. We will catch you next time on Election College. I'm Jason. And I'm Ben. And thank you very much for listening.